and it is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Thank you, Speaker. And good morning. Uh, this question is for the Premier. Nearly 10 years ago, three women were tragically murdered in Renfrew County on the same day by the same man. Since then, hundreds of women have lost their lives to acts of intimate partner violence. The first recommendation from the coroner's inquest into the murders in Renfrew County was to formally declare intimate partner violence an epidemic. It's a simple yet very important and impactful step that this government has so far resisted. So my question is, will the Premier right this wrong and support the NDP's bill to declare intimate partner violence an epidemic in Ontario? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question from uh, the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, indeed, uh, the government uh, and uh, this caucus will be supporting the private member's bill that comes before the House uh, uh, later today. Uh, in fact, we'll be going a step further, Mr. Speaker. The Premier has asked that uh, uh, we seek uh, the advice of the Standing Committee on Justice uh, to do an in-depth study on uh, all of the aspects uh, with respect to intimate partner violence, both the, uh, the current programs that are available, some of the root causes of it, and how we can do better in the province of Ontario. Uh, so we will be seeking uh, that advice uh, from the Standing Committee on Justice uh, uh, in the coming days as well. Thank you. Supplementary question. Premier, well, there's not many days when we do something like that, so I want to thank the government uh, for agreeing today. I, uh, I, I often feel, I think all of us here often feel like uh, we have a great privilege in being able to speak uh, for so many who have been more directly impacted often by things like intimate partner violence. And uh, I always say it's a privilege that we are able to be the ones to be here to advocate. Um, and I, I do want to thank the government. I, I, I am going to move on. I, I appreciate the government's commitment to uh, creating a committee. I'd like the government to consider taking everything a little bit of a step further today. Uh, we are joined, as I mentioned earlier, by dozens of survivors, their supporters, their loved ones. And they're here because Frankly, this government has ignored survivors for too long. This is the same government that cut millions in funding for the Victims' Compensation Fund, um, and they changed the eligibility rules so that it's even harder for survivors to get justice. So I'd ask the Minister if, uh, and the Premier if they might consider today explaining to the folks here today why they've taken that lifeline away and perhaps restore it. Thank you. And the House Leader. I th again, I thank uh, the Leader of the Opposition uh, for the, uh, the question. Uh, oh, look, there are a number of supports that have, uh, have been put in place, but I think it is fair to say uh, uh, that as we continue to, uh, to, to hear more, uh, that we have to do even more uh, in, in terms of responding, uh, uh, responding to this. We have a very uh, uh, good uh, program with respect to human trafficking that the, uh, the member for Halliburton Quarth Lakes brought in. That, in fact, all members of this House, uh, I think it was. Uh, I think it is an example of what we can accomplish when we work together on this. Uh, so we will have the opportunity, should the, uh, the Justice uh, Committee uh, seek to uh, approve uh, such a study, uh, to do a, a very, very in-depth uh, uh, study, come back with recommendations on what supports are available, how can we do better. We have heard across uh, different ministries uh, uh, that this impacts uh, different communities differently. I think the committee will have to go into all parts of the province. Uh, and be given the tools and the resources that it needs to come back with recommendations uh, that uh, will ensure that we have all of the supports that are in place and that we continue to lead uh, the, the nation uh, in terms of how we respond, uh, Mr. Speaker. So uh, we will do that, uh, and we will work a uh, aggressively and quickly uh, uh, with the support of all colleagues to get, uh, to get action on this. Thank you. And the final supplementary. Thank you, thank you, Speaker. And while I appreciate that the government has agreed to pass the NDP's bill today to declare intimate partner violence an epidemic, and I am very grateful uh, that we will have that done today. 
But I, I have to stress with the government the urgency of the situation. You know, everywhere I travel in this province, uh, everywhere I go practically, I have the privilege of visiting organizations that are working with uh, survivors of uh, intimate partner violence. They are struggling. They are struggling deeply. I heard one uh, shelter refer, emergency shelter tell me that uh, they feel often like they're losing staff so, so fast because they haven't seen an increase in base funding in so long that they feel like they've just become a training ground. Uh, for social workers in other organizations. This is urgent. We need to increase that base funding right now. I would ask the government, uh, let's not push this over to another committee for another 10 years or 12 years. Let's get this done today together. Thank you. Government House Leader. Look, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I want to avoid uh, uh, today uh, the, the, the temptation to, uh, to talk about and, and try and defend all of the programs and services that we have brought forward. Uh, I think what we're hearing uh, across the board is that uh, more needs to be done. There needs to be more targeted uh, measures and approaches to, uh, to this. Uh, I think we have, as I said, a very, very good example in the province of Ontario. We literally lead the world when it comes to uh, how we combat uh, human trafficking. And we have heard uh, not only uh, uh, from members opposite, from members of this caucus, from uh, different ministers, that there has to be a better coordination of how we approach this. I think a, a standing committee with the uh, full backing of, uh, of this entire House uh, to go to all parts of this province, have the ability to call ministers in front of, uh, of that committee, have the ability to call uh, survivors uh, and victims uh, of, uh, of, of this, uh, have the ability to in fact call on federal ministers to also appear before that committee, do a very in-depth, thorough uh, uh, investigation to come up with reports that we can enact as quickly as we possibly can, Mr. Speaker, because, uh, uh, look, I agree, uh, this is a, a challenge that we're facing, another one of these challenges that we're facing, uh, but as I said, I want to avoid the temptation to, uh, 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 to talk about you know, there are many good things that have been done, but we can do better, we will do better, and we will ask all parliamentarians uh, to help us in coming forward with something that works not only for the province of Ontario, but it's been so effective when it comes to human trafficking so that we can show the rest of Canada and that we can show the rest of the world how Ontario can lead and do a better job for all. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, I, I have to urge the government to consider please reinstating the funding for the Victims' Compensation Fund. Uh, the government changed the eligibility rules so that it's even harder for survivors to get justice. That fund gave survivors a way to pay for mental health supports or safe and supportive housing, but this government took that lifeline away. Uh, this is extremely important. I also want to mention uh, courts again. Uh, we were joined this morning by a survivor who had uh, the case against her, the accused stayed uh, because too much time had passed. We hear this over and over again. We would ask the government to please consider properly funding the court so that uh, victims, survivors, can truly see justice. Um, will the government? Uh, and I, and I know the government doesn't want us to be talking about all these issues today, but this is what it means to declare this an epidemic. It means that you have to now treat it like the epidemic that it is. And so I would ask again the government to restore the funding to the Victims' Compensation Fund and ensure that our courts are properly funded. And to respond, government has here. Mr. Speaker, I know that uh, again. I know that the Attorney General has been seized with ensuring that we have the proper resources in our court uh, system to uh, uh, to address uh, uh, to address this and the other issues that we're facing uh, uh, in the criminal justice system. But as I said, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I want to be very clear about this uh, to the Leader of the Opposition and to colleagues on on all sides of the House. Everything is on the table. We want to look at every aspect of this uh, so that we can come with a Team Ontario approach to how we deal with the challenges that are being faced, Mr. Speaker. Uh, is, it, it could include uh, uh, issues that, with respect to how the federal government, uh, criminal uh, justice legislation from the federal government. It could definitely include the, re the, the supports that we already have in place. How do the courts uh, uh, deal with this? What are victims? What are the challenges that victims have faced 
uh, in, in addressing some of uh, the concerns? Are there obstacles? Are there roadblocks? I would suggest that everything should be Response. on the table, Mr. Speaker. We will authorize, uh, should the committee uh, accept this challenge, uh, we will authorize them and provide them all of the necessary re uh, resources that they need to travel the entire province, to go to other jurisdictions if that need be. We will do better, and we can uh, accomplish that together, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Speaker, uh, the Renfrew report gave us 86 recommendations. This government, 68 of those are provincial jurisdiction. We don't need another a study. We don't need another study. What we need is action from this government. 68 recommendations. 68 recommendations. 30 women last year were killed in 30 weeks in this province. 58 women killed in incidents of intimate partner violence. There is no waiting around. There is no need for more studies. They have written you the recipe mm -hmm. for getting close to fixing this. Will the government implement, implement the 68 recommendations of the Red Fruit Report? And the government house leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Again, I want to resist the temptation to, uh, uh, to outline and highlight all of the things that we are doing, because there are a number of things that we have done to implement many of the recommendations uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the report. I know the ministers, uh, uh, the, the ministers, along with the Justice Minister and the Solicitor General, have been working very, very hard across government departments to ensure that we have a whole-of-government approach. But it is clear to us, Mr. Speaker, that more needs to be done and that we need greater advice, not only from parliamentarians on both sides of the chamber, but we need to hear from, uh, uh, from victims uh, of, of, of this. We need to hear from subject matter experts. We need to hear from those who respond. What are the challenges that they are facing in helping to deal with this, Mr. Speaker? Uh, everything is on the table. I, I don't know how much more clear I can be to the Leader of the Opposition. Everything is on the table. We want to build Response. on the, the programs and services that we already have. Uh, but we also want to look at other jurisdictions to see what they're doing and how Ontario can not only uh, uh, copy good programs but be a leader the way we have been in so many other uh, in so many other ways, Mr. Speaker. So we will get that job done. The final supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. With the greatest of respect uh, to the minister, we have seen this government. Uh, use committees and opportunities like this to just stretch things out. Uh, and people do not have time for that right now. You know, I, I want to tell you one of the issues I wanted to raise today as well um, is the major hurdle that so many who are escaping intimate partner violence experience. Without access to funds, uh, survivors are facing an often impossible choice of whether or not they flee violence with their children uh, and risk that. Uh, and, take the and take the risk of ending up homeless uh, or in living in poverty or living with endless uncertainty. The government uh, is, I think, going to maybe call another committee together. I would get, again urge the government to consider simply looking at the recommendations of the Renfrew inquest. We have had so many reports over so many years. The trauma uh, that people Question. experience is generational. I would ask the government again you know, consider what is being, what you are being told by the experts, the people living on the front line, the people working on the front line, and please don't don't spread this out anymore. Let's just get this done. Accept the Renfrew recommendations. Members, please take their seats. Government House Leader. Again, Speaker, uh, look, I thank the, the Leader of the Opposition for the questions. Uh, this is about ensuring that we move forward. I know that the Minister is responsible, the Minister, uh, uh, in cooperation. It's been a whole of government approach to how we deal with this so that we can be as effective as possible in dealing with the concerns of, uh, of not only victims, but those who provide our services, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, let me be very, very clear. Uh, I have every faith that a parliamentary committee, given the resources, uh, that, it, uh, that is required will come forward with very valuable recommendations. We have seen this time and time again. We need not look any further than the extraordinary work that was done on human trafficking, uh, led by the member for Halliburton Quarth Lakes Brox, but supported by all members. We have done such an amazing job on that, Mr. Speaker, that what Ontario has done has become a beacon of hope for jurisdictions around the world. And now we are going to do the same. I trust. 
uh, parliamentarians to give this vigorous, vigorous study. But I want to go, if the committee agrees, we want to go into every part of this province. Response. We want to go to other jurisdictions. We want to go across Canada. We want to ask our federal partners to participate in this. We will come back with a, a plan that works better, that improves on what we've already put in place and responds to the needs of victims and those who are helping victims. Thank you. Next question, the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. I am incredibly disappointed to hear the government House member House Leader talk about sending this to a committee two, Order. nearly two Order. years ago. Order. How about you Order. have some respect for the survivors and the parents who have lost children to intimate partner Order. violence and listen to what I have to say. Almost two years ago, there was an inquest and a jury said that the government needs to immediately declare intimate partner violence an epidemic. There were other recommendations that came from that, that for two years, this government has done nothing. So the people Order. on this side of the Order. House and the people in the gallery Order. today don't want you stalling anymore. So I appreciate that the government says Question. that they're going to support Bill 173 and declare intimate partner violence an epidemic. But what I'm asking, not for me, but for the people in the gallery and the people watching at home, is don't send it to committee for another study because the inquest was clear what needs to be done. Pass the legislation today. Pass it third, through third reading. Get it through royal assent and give these people the dignity, the respect that they deserve for everything they have done. Thank you. I ask the members to take their seats. And I will remind all members to make their comments through the chair. To reply for the government, the government house leader. Uh, thanks again, Mr. Speaker. Look, uh, uh, again, there have been a tremendous amount of resources uh, uh, put forward, a whole of government approach to how we deal with this challenge. I know uh, uh, the ministers have been working on that and have continuously been uh, uh, improving systems, but we know that more needs to be done, and that is why. Uh, we have agreed uh, that we will pass this today, but at the same time, we want to uh, uh, seek uh, the advice of a parliamentary committee to give us a better understanding of what additional supports are needed. Now, we've heard this consistently. We've heard this from victims. We've heard it from members of the opposition that they have suggestions uh, and that we can learn. That is what this parliamentary committee will do, Mr. Speaker. I am disappointed that uh, the opposition uh, is, 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 is frustrated by that, but I am actually very encouraged by what a parliamentary committee working together can accomplish. We will leave no stone unturned to improve on what we have already built in the province of, of, uh, of Ontario. We will look at the justice system. We will look at the services that we provide victims. We will look at ways of making it Response. easier for victims to get those services. We will look at laws or legislation that might be on the tables in the, in, in, in the federal, with the federal government that might need to be changed. We'll look at other jurisdictions. We'll work quickly and effectively, and we will crisscross not only the entire province, but we will go anywhere that we need to to ensure that the people who have been victims of this and the people who provide those services get the care and the resources they need to address that. Supplementary question, back to Mr. West. Speaker, again, I will remind the government house leader, you've had almost two years, two years, to act on that one recommendation, among others, and you soundly rejected it, soundly rejected it. So there is no trust on this side of the house, or for survivors, or for victims' families, or for the advocates that you are going to move this bill through committee in a timely fashion. So again, I ask that you immediately pass it today, pass it through th reading, and give it royal assent, regardless of whether the Minister of Energy wants to heckle me previously saying that it's not going to do anything if it receives royal assent. Speaker, the government rejected Recommendation 4, which called on the creation of the role of a survivor advocate, and they rejected Recommendation 5 to institute a provincial implementation committee dedicated to ensuring that the recommendation from the inquest are implemented and reported on. So I'm going to ask the government side, why should survivors and their families and the service providers believe that you are not just going to send this bill to committee in the hopes that nothing actually comes out of it. 
reply. I will remind the members to make their comments through the chair. Government House Leader. So, Speaker, to be clear, that, that we are passing the bill through to committee, but simultaneously we will be reaching out to committee and asking them to conclude or to, to begin the process of a very extensive study on all aspects of intimate partner violence concurrent with the bill being in front of committee, Mr. Speaker. We will have the ability to call ministers uh, in this government. We will have the ability to call victims in front of the committee. We will have the, vic uh, the ability to call providers of services, uh, Mr. Speaker, and we will crisscross the entire province to find out what we can do better and how quickly uh, uh, we can enact some of those, those changes, Mr. Speaker. Look, I can sit here and, uh, and, and highlight all of the great work that the ministers have done to address this. But I don't think today is the day for that, Mr. Speaker. What we're going to do is we are going to engage all parliamentarians, all parliamentarians, in an effort to replicate the great work that we did on human trafficking. I think members on both sides of the House Response. will agree that what we accomplished on human trafficking is an example of Parliament working at its best. And I believe, Mr. Speaker, I believe, Mr. Speaker, that we can do the exact same thing here, and we will provide the resources necessary to do just that. Thank you. The next question, the member for Perth Wellington. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Energy, Speaker. We all know that the people of Ontario are struggling with the rising costs of food, fuel, fuel and everyday essential items because of the federal Liberal carbon tax. However, when the premiers of all political strikes, spe stripes, Speaker, NDP, Liberal, PC, the members opposite are saying no, but it's the truth, Speaker. Even the NDP minister, premier in Manitoba is against the federal Liberal carbon tax. And the Prime Minister said that they were making political hay, Speaker, when they did that. I don't think our Prime Minister has ever lifted a bale of hay in his life, Speaker. When I speak to farmers in my riding of Perth Wellington, I constantly hear about how the production— I have lifted plenty of bales of hay, sir. I grew up on a farm, and I am proud of that. We know that the rising expenses for our hardworking farmers are only making food more expensive Question. for all Ontarians. The federal government needs to enact now and get rid of this regressive tax, Speaker. Speaker, can the minister please explain how the carbon tax is driving up the costs of everything for Ontarians, especially our hardworking farmers? Thank you. Thank you. I can tell the time. Thanks very much. Minister of Energy. Thanks very much, and thank you to the uh, very robust member from uh, Perth Wellington, who comes from one of the uh, largest agricultural communities in the entire province, Mr. Speaker. And the carbon tax isn't just affecting energy bills, the cost is affecting everything that we purchase in the province and making life more unaffordable for the people of Ontario. And that's why, under the leadership of Premier Ford, we've fought the federal carbon tax since 2018, Mr. Speaker. It is you know, causing obviously a tax on greenhouses where tomatoes are grown. It's putting a tax on the transportation to get those tomatoes to the grocery store. It's creating a tax at the grocery store where they're uh, paying the carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. So clearly, it is having a multiplying effect and driving up the cost of everything. And everybody seems to Response. understand that across Canada, except for federal Liberals and Ontario Liberals in this House. We know the Queen of the Carbon Tax, Bonnie Crombie, supports her federal cousins, Justin Trudeau and Stephen Guibo. We don't, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. Last week, the grain farmers of Ontario said they were going to see an additional $2.7 billion worth of expenses because of the federal Liberal carbon tax. For vegetable growers, they're looking at an additional 90,000 per acre in carbon tax by 2030, Speaker. Speaker, that is more than three times what the current cost of farmland per acre is in Ontario, Speaker. Speaker, our farmers need our support, and that's why our government continues to fight this disastrous Liberal carbon tax every step of the way. But, Speaker, the queen of the carbon tax, Bonnie Crombie, has never seen a tax she does not like. To this date, the Liberals in this place still refuse to stand up against this carbon tax. 
Speaker, can the minister please tell this House why Ontario Question. families cannot afford this tax increase that Bonnie Crombie is planning for? Thank you, Speaker. Minister of Energy. Uh, Speaker, um, I want to thank our Minister of Agriculture, who hosted an event along with the Premier last week with uh, a number of different farming organizations, including the Grain Farmers of Ontario, to talk about the impact that the carbon tax is having. It's, it's ironic, actually, that it's driving up the cost, but it's actually uh, discouraging reducing emissions across the agriculture sector because many of these grain farmers and many other farmers you know, want access to natural gas so they can move away from more emitting fuels to this less emitting natural gas. Now, the federal uh, Liberal government wants to slap the carbon tax on everybody, and they don't just want to slap it on now, which they did last week. They want to increase it uh, by triple by the end of the decade, Mr. Speaker, which is unheard of. It's going to make everything in our province unattainable and more expensive. Expensive, Mr. Speaker, and at the same time, the NDP in this House are opposed to Bill 165, which is going to make it impossible uh, for natural gas to be extended to these same grain farmers who want to use it to drive down uh, their emissions from higher emitting fuels, Mr. Speaker. So there's only one party you can really trust when it comes to the energy system in Ontario, and that is Premier Doug Ford, Response. our Ministry of Energy that's making life more affordable for the people. People of Ontario, in spite. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, the member for Nickelbelt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question pour le Premier. I have a question for the Prime Minister. Violence committed by uh, people who are in an uh, intimate relationship. So the government closed the provincial police station at Abogama, and the long times when people are calling for help. It's created a lot of tensions. I'm happy that the government is going to uh, agree with the bill that's been presented by the NDP, but is the government going to assure us that we are going to have solutions as soon as possible to help Francophone and Northern Ontario communities? Again, I appreciate uh, the question from the member opposite. Uh, of course, we're going to uh, uh, work as quickly as we can. We understand that, uh, the severity of, uh, of uh, the situation. As I said, uh, uh, there is uh, there is no point in us uh, uh, highlighting all of the extraordinary work that has been done already. Uh, I think there are a lot of things that we can be very proud of, but we have to do more. Right? Uh, we've heard that loud and clear that more has to be done. There needs to be more uh, 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 work done with respect to how it is impacting uh, northern communities. Uh, we've heard from uh, 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 various other communities too that it is impacting them in different ways. Uh, uh, speaker, and we've heard, frankly, uh, 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 across the country from our partners in other provinces that uh, uh, more work needs to be done in cooperation with each other. And of course, with the, the, the people who provide services uh, uh, to the victims have asked. Uh, 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 for better coordination. So, yes, absolutely, we will work Response. quickly. Uh, we will do a, an extensive study, but the committee can work as quickly as it possibly can, and we will provide it with the resources that it needs to get the job done properly, Mr. Speaker, and provide Parliament with recommendations that we can act uh, upon as quickly as possible. Thank you much. A supplementary question, the member for Kuwaitna. Uh, miigwech, Speaker. I'm in the Speaker, uh, First Nations uh, policing is funded as a program, not as an essential service. Extra resources um, are needed to ensure women experiencing intimate partner violence on reserve get the uh, referrals to victim services they need. If uh, First Nations uh, policing were essential services, they wouldn't need to apply to get this kind of funding. Speaker, uh, will this government Stop underfunding First Nations police support services. Here, here. To apply, the Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for the question. We take public safety all across Ontario very, very seriously. And as the federal government is considering uh, making it uh, uh, the essential service, as the member opposite said, this is something that we will, we will absolutely support. But in the meantime, as the member knows, as the Community Safety and Policing Act came into force just last week, First Nation police uh, communities have the right to opt in, and we hope they, they do, so that we will continue to fund 
adequate policing services and to provide those monies for the communities that they need. I take this responsibility very, very seriously. I take public safety across Ontario very seriously. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Transportation. The carbon tax is hurting our economy and businesses. When I spoke with many families and business owners just last week in my great riding of Newmarket Aurora, they were telling me that they feel that the federal Liberals are out of touch. They are especially concerned about how the federal government is adding to the cost of living. By by increasing the carbon tax yet again. People in our province are already struggling with high interest rates and living expenses. Speaker, the last thing they need is another tax hike. Unlike the opposition NDP and the independent Liberals, our government will not stop until the federal Liberals scrap the tax once and for all. Speaker, can the minister please explain the impact the federal carbon tax is having on Ontario families and businesses? To reply, the Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My colleague is absolutely right. In fact, Mr. Speaker, last week uh, we joined farmers, truckers, small business owners, workers uh, in urging the federal government to scrap the 23 per cent increase to our carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. We know it makes life harder for businesses and families across this province. While those businesses and families are struggling, the federal Liberals continue to pursue an increase uh, to the federal carbon tax, and we know that there are going to be more of these. But what's most surprising, Mr. Speaker, is that Bonnie Crombie and the provincial re Liberals refuse to add their voice and asking the federal government to scrap Response. the carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. We will always uh, be supporting small business owners, truckers, and farmers in our fight to stand united against this carbon tax. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. Every day, the hard-working men and women in our trucking industry deliver the goods that we all rely upon. They play an essential role in keeping our hospitals equipped with the supplies they need and keeping the shelves stocked at our grocery stores. However, Speaker, the carbon tax only makes it more expensive for our truckers to do their job. While the carbon tax queen, Bonnie Crombie, and her Liberal Party continue to ignore the concerns of our constituents, our government will always stand up for the Ontarians. It's time to eliminate the tax now. Speaker. Can the minister please explain the impact the federal carbon tax is having Question. on our trucking industry? Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The carbon tax makes it harder for truckers to deliver the goods that we all need. The unsung heroes of our economy, whether it was during the pandemic or every single day, they are the reason our store shelves are stocked, our pharmacies are stocked, our um, uh, materials are getting to uh, places across uh, this province. But let's listen to the Ontario Trucking Association, uh, Mr. Speaker, that says the carbon tax raises the cost of deliveries by 6 per cent, Mr. Speaker, and that doesn't even take into consideration the cost to truckers as they deliver these goods. Fifteen to $20,000 is what it, the carbon tax costs a long-haul uh, truck driver in this uh, province, Mr. Speaker. That is fifteen to $20,000 that could be going towards their families. That's fifteen to $20,000 that, uh, that could be going uh, to them to, to make life uh, more affordable and Response. easier for themselves. So we continue to call on the federal government and our provincial Liberals to condemn this 23 per cent uh, hike, Mr. Speaker, because we need to support the drivers and the people of this province. The next question, the member for St. Catharines. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Eighteen months ago, I stood here, right here, demanding action on the Renfrew County recommendations. What did we get? Half measures and empty promises. 
Since then, Niagara declared the intimate partner violence is an epidemic. Since then, Niagara women's shelters like Jillian's Place and Gateway had to turn away nearly a thousand women for lack of space. It's a disgrace, a complete disgrace. You've had a plan on your desk for two years, and to agree to only now commit to another study is frankly not enough. Minister, boost the shelters, commit to base increase base funding, and give our survivors the resources and the affordable housing they desperately need right now. Minister, if you're serious about interpartner violence and, and you care about the survivors and respect them, when will you act on this, Minister, and implement it? Again, I'll remind the members to make their comments through the chair. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. For the question, and I thank all the members here in this House. Mr. Speaker, uh, through our government, I thank the leadership of, the, of Premier Ford. We have made this very clear from day one, Mr. Speaker. This is an issue that affects all communities across the province, mm -hmm. one that requires action, which is why in December, Minister Williams joined me for in <laughs> announcing Ontario stands. Mr. Speaker, it, it was a statement to the province that we take this issue seriously and we back that up by investments, working with the federal government. I said this throughout the entire time that I've been a minister at this ministry, Mr. Speaker. No woman in, or girl in this province should ever have to live with the yeah. fear of violence or threat or exploitation. We will stand with them. We will make sure every single provider that's helping the partnership with us across the province will have a partner in our government. Response. We will not let them down, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. I'm wearing purple today in support of the very brave women who endure violent and often unseen crimes. There is no excuse for violence against women ever. The Violence Prevention Coordination Council of Durham represents 35 local agencies, and they have reported a significant increase in demand for assistance. These aren't numbers, these are women. I'm pleased that Durham Region a year ago adopted the number one recommendation of the Renfrew County Inquest to declare intimate partner violence an epidemic in this province. We're glad to hear that the province is going to, but I can't just say thank you. I'm going to say that many women that Luke's Place Support and Resource Centre that they're working with don't have access to a lawyer. Legal aid could waive the eligibility requirements for victims of domestic violence. The province could put money in to legal aid. So we're going to ask for specifics. Will the government put money into legal aid to ensure women leaving abuse have the legal support that they need? Thank you. Respond, the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member again for the question. Mr. Speaker, uh, through Ontario Stands, as I mentioned when we worked with the federal government, there are a plenty of initiatives here and supports in this statement and this action plan that the province has put forward. Mr. Speaker, the investments that we announced in December to all the partners on the ground, uh, an additional $18 million uh, for the duration of, of this fiscal year, that investment will increase, Mr. Speaker, in Budget 2024, an additional $13.5 million was added to the support. Mr. Speaker, there's a lot of great work that's being done uh, on underground by service providers and partners. We want to make sure they have the resources to be able to provide those supports. That needs to become both backed by investments. We've passed legislation to make sure that happens so Response. that people are protected. But that needs to be backed by investments, and I thank the Premier for the commitment, and I thank the Minister of Finance. As I said, Mr. Speaker, we will not let them down. We will make sure that they have, they have the supports they need underground to help every single person in every community. Thank you. The next question, the member for Kingston and the Islands. Uh, Mr. Speaker, retired judges have warned this Premier to give up his agenda of taking away Lady Justice's blindfold and replacing it with blue-tinted glasses. Justice doesn't come from judges thinking like the Premier, but from judges believing that they have a duty to follow the law and their conscience and to serve the people. For everyday disputes, people rely on Ontario's tribunals and expect to get a fair shake. The powers that be just can't just do whatever they want. But under this government, experienced adjudicators appointed under the previous government were not reappointed, leaving many vacancies. The Landlord and Tenant Board, Social Benefits and Human Rights Tribunals lost 35% of their members by 2020. 
Will the Premier admit he is taking his time to find and appoint like-minded adjudicators for Ontario's tribunals? To reply, the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Not only are the tribunals independent, but so is the recruitment process, Mr. Speaker. And I'm very proud of the fact that we have doubled the number of landlord-tenant board adjudicators, Mr. Speaker, in the last short while. I, it, it's unfortunate that, that uh, the tremendous members that we have across the, the 15 tribunals uh, un, under MAG uh, are being slighted by the member opposite, Mr. Speaker. They are professionals Shameful. who are doing the work of the Shameful. people of Ontario in an independent and fair manner, Mr. Speaker, and it really is unfortunate that the member wouldn't celebrate that with us. Supplementary, back to the member for Kingston and the Islands. Mr. Speaker, the Attorney General touts the, uh, the large number of adjudicators now working at the long, uh, LTB, but, but here's the story. They let the big tribunals lose a third of their experienced adjudicators by 2020, and backlogs grew. Uh, by last year, LTB backlogs had grown from 14,000 when they took power to 53,000. So they had to react to a problem they created. The LTB has doubled the adjudicators it had when the Conservatives took power in 2018, but things have not improved. Big problems, double the payroll, that'll fix things, kind of like the Premier's own office. Will the Premier acknowledge the grief and financial losses because landlords and tenants and victims of accidents, harassment and discrimination have had to wait too long? Will he admit that this can't happen again whenever the government changes? Will he support Bill 179, the fewer Question. backlogs and less, less partisan tribunals act, and send it to committee? The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and just by way of an update, I guess, for the, for the member who may not have been paying full attention, you know, of the, of the 15 tribunals, 13 have come back to balance after COVID, Mr. Speaker. We are now hitting our targets in 13 of those 15 tribunals. And we are well on our way with the Landlord Tenant Board, Mr. Speaker, by putting in resources for administrators, for uh, adjudicators, for back office systems, Mr. Speaker, that the Liberals let go fallow, Mr. Speaker. They were broken when we got here. We are fixing it. We are getting it done. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Speaker, last week when I was in my riding of Hastings, Lennox and Addington, I heard from so many constituents about how the federal Liberal tax is simply making their life unaffordable. Ontarians are already coping with high interest rates and a rising cost of living, and the last thing they need is another tax hike. With last week's hike, the Liberal carbon tax is now forcing Ontarians to pay 17.6 cents on every litre of gas. That's hundreds of dollars a year in, for the average household speaker. And unlike the Liberals and the NDP members across the aisle, who are still refusing to admit that the carbon tax costs all of us, our government will always speak up on behalf of Ontarians. The federal government needs to scrap this tax now. Speaker, will the minister please tell his house how our government is keeping costs down for Ontarians while Question. the members opposite continue to remain silent? The minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And first, I want to thank the member for Hastings, Lennox, and Addington for being a great PA for me for uh, almost two time. years. Uh, did an absolutely fantastic job, and I, I know the member, <laughs> well, the member from Newmarket and Aurora is going to do an equally fantastic job. Speaker, you know we all know that uh, when you go to work every day, you're paying the carbon tax in your vehicle driving on the road, but you know you're also paying it off the road too. We've got members of the Ontario Federation of Trail Riders here today that are supporting responsible trail use all throughout Ontario with off-road motorcycles. And every time you gas up that motorcycle now, you're paying a carbon tax. Every time you want to enjoy the great outdoors by riding your ATV, using a snowmobile, filling up your boat, you're paying a carbon tax. It's almost, Mr. Speaker, almost like the federal Liberals and their Ontario cousins here do not want people to enjoy the great outdoors no. in Ontario. Response. They're taking away a little bit of fun, a little bit at a time with the carbon tax. It's time for them to end this carbon tax. Time for them to support people getting out and enjoying the great outdoors in Ontario. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the minister for, the, for his response and for being a great leader for me for the last couple of years. 
It's, Speaker, it's just not fair to punish the hardworking people in our province with this carbon tax. Life has only become more challenging for individuals and families in both rural and northern Ontario who end up relying exclusively on their vehicles for transportation. They are being hit hardest at the gas pumps and at the grocery stores. And what's worse is that Bonnie Crombie, the queen of the carbon tax, oh, yeah. and her Liberal cohort want to keep on rising, increasing your gas prices and bring back the cap-and-trade system. They're just like their federal Liberals who take every opportunity to add more costs to Ontarians' bills. They've never met a tax they wouldn't raise. Question. So speaker, can the minister please explain what our government is doing to make my life more affordable for the people of rural and northern Ontario and all across this province? Natural resources and forestry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know what we're doing is exactly what the Liberals aren't doing, which is supporting the people of Ontario every day, supporting them with the actions of the Minister of Finance and the Premier of Ontario, reducing the cost of gas in this province so people can get up in the morning take their kids to school. Like, let's think about the life of a Northern Ontario person. They're going to get up in the morning, they're going to take their kids to school, they're going to fill up their truck, pay a bunch of carbon tax, go to the grocery store, pay a bunch of carbon tax on the food that got shipped there, go to work for a while, go home, pick those kids up again. All this carbon tax baked into it. They're going to want to go out for a little bit of fun afterwards, maybe take the kids to the arena or get on that off-road vehicle and enjoy it. Carbon tax, carbon tax, carbon tax. Mr. Speaker, the madness has to stop. I know April 1st has come and gone, but it's never too late to do the right thing, as somebody once said. Spons? On the other side of the aisle one time. Let's get rid of that carbon tax. Our friends across the aisle know that it's the wrong thing for Ontarians. Tell your federal... Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Anne Marie and Jasmine Reddy were killed in their family home almost two years ago by a young man with a history of assault and sexual harassment. Their father, Raphael Reddy, has now devoted his life to ending violence against women. And he wants this House to act on recommendations 32 and 33 of the Renfrew County Inquest Report so we can reach perpetrators of violence against women and people who are likely perpetrators of violence against women. Is the government committed to implementing those recommendations today? The Associate Minister with Responsibility for Women's Social and Economic Opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member for the question, and I want to uh, just commend uh, that man for the work he's doing to make sure uh, the, the, the tragedies that have happened have not happened in vain. And I, I want to make it very clear that we, no woman should ever be subjected to violence. No woman should ever have to live in fear, be intimidated, and that's why I know we are working really hard in our government to put um, strategies in place to ensure that we're looking to community and organizations. I want to encourage everybody to take a look at Ontario stands. For, for Pars, Minister Parsa, or the Minister Responsible Community Ch Children's Social Services, we went and brought this to Ontario and we said, we want to hear from you. Ontario stands in the second goal, calls for community organizations Response. to bring us the proposal so that we can fund and close the gaps to keep women safe in Ontario. And so please, if community members don't know about it, share Ontario stance, because we believe every woman has the right to be safe in Ontario. And the supplementary question, Member for Niagara Falls. My question is to the Premier. Just last year, a Niagara woman, a first responder, was murdered in what police called an act of intimate partner violence. The family is devastated, navigating a broken and difficult system to find justice for their loved one that was so cruelly taken from this world. As one of the most heartbreaking realities for a family is the knowledge that this type of violence is far too common. Nearly 100 municipalities have declared IPV an epidemic, including Niagara. Will the government do the right thing today? support my colleague's bill to declare IPV an epidemic immediately. A study is not needed. The recommendations are clear. Declare it an epidemic today. Thank you. Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. 
Mr. Speaker, and again, I thank the honourable member uh, for the question. As uh, the government house leader indicated already, we are um, looking at passing this, and as he mentioned, taking it a step further to make sure all members of this committee have the opportunity to contribute to the solution. All partners who are doing great work on the ground are contributing to this. Mr. Speaker, that is what our government has said from day one. I have said this on many occasions. This is an issue that affects every single person in every community of our province. We need to work together, which is why we signed the National Action Plan, an agreement with the federal government, for us to be able to work together because this is not a partisan issue. We will work with municipalities. We're working with all partners on the ground to make sure that we end violence against women in all its forms, in every community, and we need your help. You need to come together. We need to work on this committee to make sure Response. that we hear from survivors, we hear from community partners. Mr. Order. Speaker, we invest over $250 million annually on violence against women initiatives, over $10 million on preventative measures. Thank you very much. Thank you. The House will come to order. The next question, the member for Kanata Carleton. Thank you, Speaker. This government insists on tightening the belt for everyone but themselves. They've cut the salaries of nurses and health care workers, teachers and education workers, Order. even air ambulance drivers. But a quick look at the Premier's office and you will see his budget has exploded. His staff is being paid $6.9 million, the most expensive Premier's office in history. 48 staffers, not just in total, but 48 Order. staffers are earning more than $100,000 every single year. When this premier was running for office, he said he'd be the one to stop the fat cats, to stop the gravy train, but he's worse than any of his predecessors. Spending $6.9 million every year, the Premier is the most expensive Premier we've ever had, Question. more than double any other Premier. When Ontarians face austerity, how will the Premier explain his runaway and self-serving expenses to the people of Ontario? And to respond, Government House Leader. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Uh, really, an ironic question coming from, from the member opposite, who was a, a member of a federal government who uh, expanded the civil service by what, 35 percent? Uh, whose, whose federal cousin's policies Order. are literally devastating the community that she represents, Mr. Speaker. But you know what we're going to do? We're going to go back to the people of the province of Ontario two years from now, and we're going to say to them, look, we have put in place the climate that has seen Order. over 700,000 jobs created in the province of Ontario. We've cut red tape. We're building subways, Mr. Speaker. We're building hospitals, Mr. Speaker. We have got over $40 billion worth of economic development jobs created in the province of Ontario. You know why, Mr. Speaker? Because we're doing the work Order. that is necessary to make Ontario the engine of the economy of the country. Now, I know the Liberals opposite Response. are coming and hollering and screaming, Mr. Speaker, because for them, what they like is when Canada and Ontario doesn't work, we want Okay. I'm going to ask the member for Ottawa South to come to order and the member from Mississauga Centre to come to order. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. This government is wasting time and money by continually needing a do-over, implementing disastrous legislation only to have it to repeal it months later. The Green Belt, Urban Boundaries, Bill 124, and now development charges. Now, it's not a bad thing to reverse a bad decision, but you need to learn from your mistakes rather than continuing to follow an unintelligible ideology. Measure twice, cut once was my dad's advice. Why is the Premier okay with wastefully burning through Ontarians' hard-earned tax dollars while expecting Ontarians to scrimp and save? Government House Leader. Well, let's, let's be clear, Mr. Speaker. What we're doing is putting more money back in the pockets of the people of the province of Ontario. It is actually the Liberals who have said that they will reverse the tax cuts that we have made, right? The Liberal leader actually said that cutting taxes for people is a gimmick, yeah. so that when we put more money back in the pockets of hardworking Ontarians, 
it's a gimmick because what they want to do again is increase taxes, Mr. Speaker, for the people of the province of Ontario. They want to drive away jobs because we know what the Liberal plan always is, right? It is to make people, people responsible to government. It is not to help people, Mr. Speaker. They want people to rely exclusively on government, Mr. Speaker. What we want to do is build an economy where all Ontarians Order. can thrive. We don't want a carbon tax. They do. We cut gas taxes. Response. They'll increase them. The taxes that we've reduced, they want to increase. Their very first job of the leader of the, op of the, leader of the Liberal Party was to beg for a million dollars to cut our salary. Order. 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 Member for Ottawa South will come to order. The Minister of Energy will come to order. The next question, the member for Thornhill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. So there are plenty of countries around this world who've proven you can take climate change seriously without an inflationary carbon tax. So, unfortunately, Trudeau's Liberal government has chosen to implement a carbon tax that punishes the hard-working people of this province by driving up prices across the board. You, you, don't, you don't fight climate change by taxing citizens until they can afford to heat their homes, drive their cars, and put food on their tables. Just look south of the border where politicians of all political stripes are vehemently against the idea of a carbon tax. Speaker, can the minister please highlight how, since we took office, we've strengthening, uh, we strengthened our trade relationships with the U.S., who doesn't have a carbon tax? Order. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thank you, Speaker. When we are in the U.S., companies tell us they cannot comprehend this carbon tax. They know any additional taxes are harmful. Now, Ontario is the U.S.'s third largest trading partner after Mexico and China. $494 billion in two-way trade between Ontario and U.S. That's up more than $100 billion since we took office. But all the products that these companies buy from us are now more expensive because of this carbon tax. We are putting our trade at risk with our largest partner because of these rising prices. Mexico does not have a carbon tax. The U.S. has alternatives than buying from Ontario. Scrap Order. the tax. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his globe-trotting and tireless efforts for the people of Ontario. The federal Liberal government always touts how well the U.S. is doing on climate change, but what they don't mention is that the U.S. does not have a carbon tax that raises the cost of everything. The Trudeau Liberals continue to hike their carbon tax, all the while their friend Bonnie Crombie says nothing. If the Liberals listened to the businesses and workers of this province, they would understand that no one supports their carbon tax. In 2019, they told everyone the carbon tax wouldn't increase, but it's now costing people an extra 18 cents a litre at the pump while it drives up the prices of everything. Speaker, we know where the U.S. stands. Uh, on carbon tax. But can the minister talk about what Ontario's other Question. trading partners think about the Liberals' carbon tax? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, companies always ask us to explain the federal government's carbon tax. And it is a difficult answer because one in five jobs in Ontario depend on trade. Ontario has tariff-free markets in over 50 countries around the world. Adding a carbon tax is adding a cost to everything we sell globally. The federal Liberal carbon Order. tax is putting companies' sales at risk. It's putting our economy for Hamilton at risk. Mountain come it's to putting order. Ontario jobs at risk. Now, Ontario. We've lowered taxes. We're showing the Liberals that there is a path. Scrap the tax today. 
The next question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier, and I, I want to acknowledge that today is a very emotional day for many of us, including the survivors who are here with us today. Uh, I'm thinking of Latonya Anderson from Whitby and Angie Sweeney from Sault Ste. Marie, Argentina Fuentes from Mississauga. They lost their lives to intimate partner violence. They do not, their families do not need to go through another re-traumatizing committee work. We have the answers to address intimate partner violence. We need to apply them. Uh, money, Speaker, is actually, or rather lack of it, has always been a major hurdle for those trying to escape intimate partner violence and abuse. Poverty often keeps women and children in unsafe situations. And without access to supportive funds, survivors face the impossible choice of living under ever-present threats of death or flee into poverty, homelessness, and endless uh, uncertainty. That's why it's more urgent than ever that we fund and build supportive housing options. To the Premier, Question. why was dedicated funding for supportive housing for survivors of intimate partner violence left out of this year's budget again? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. And again, I thank the uh, uh, honourable member for the question, Mr. Speaker. As I mentioned, through Ontario Stands, we all have a proposal in place where, in every single community, uh, they can put forward proposals for support in the during the duration of the National Action Plan, which is we're in the second year now. That is backed by investments. As I mentioned to you, there are localized solutions that community partners are aware of. We want to hear from them. We want partners on the ground to come forward with ideas and submissions for us to be able to support them. That is what the call for proposal is about. We invested in our partners in the first year. The second year, we are looking at working with them on localized support, supports, Mr. Speaker, that in rural, northern communities might be different than it is in downtown Toronto. We want to hear from the partners on the ground who we're ready to work with them to make sure that we combat violence against women in all its forms in every corner of this province, Mr. Speaker. That concludes question period for today. Do you have a point of